Hey everyone, this is Lucid, and I'm going to be doing the National Overview for Vettiheim. Now, I want to start this video out by talking about a very specific claim that I made. Uh, I had put in the, uh, the tier list that I thought Vettiheim was S tier. Right? And what that means is that it has overwhelming advantages without corresponding overwhelm or without corresponding disadvantages. So it can kind of get out of control in a game. That's kind of the idea behind an S tier. I said they have some pretty strong mechanics which allow them to snowball really hard. I think that's common to basically every S tier nation. Um, it, it's not always a snowball, but usually it's some overwhelming advantage, and then they don't have any huge crippling disadvantage. And uh, I want to start this video off with uh, a little battle, and this is going to show you, and I don't have this scripted exactly perfectly, but we're going to watch it. This is going to show you a little bit of the strength of, of Vettiheim. Over here we've got, this is just one of the things I like to quickly stress test, army compositions and stuff against, and it, you know, it's not perfect because you can cheese it with a bunch of things, foul vapors and stuff. We're not going to do that. This is a decent stress test. Take Abyssia in whatever age you're in, put mass protection on them, and then see how well your troops do in clearing it. That's just a fun kind of stress test to do. This is 80 PD, so it's about 300 units. And you can see with uh, a protection buff, they're pretty solid, you know? Like, they hit pretty hard, they got pretty high protection, they're a pretty decent troop. And they've got the axe throwers, you know. It's nothing amazing. But I want to show you what we're doing over here. We've got a very small crew. We can calculate the gold cost at the end, but these guys are about 200. The hags, I've got a few of the hags. The hags are... I thought I had a hagger. Here's a hag. These are like 50 gold. And then the berserkers are, I think, 10. So if this is under 1,000 gold, I think. And if we were to, you know, if this were an army from Abyssia, which wouldn't be a range like this, it would be scripted better and stuff. Um, but, you know, this would be probably 3,000 gold at least. Um, anyway. But what we're basically doing is a bunch of point uh, buffing. And um, I, since this is going to be a let's play, uh, I'm going to turn this into a video, hopefully, um, or a series. Uh, I'm going to show you one of the main... There's a lot Vettiheim can do, okay? But I'm going to give you a... This is the lure, right, for you to watch the rest of the video. This is one of the the major strategies that I think Vettiheim can abuse. And this will go through different iterations at different phases of the game. Uh, and by the end, it can be huge armies of this rather than small little squads. Um, but, yeah, this is one... Like, if you're going to be an S tier kind of, like if you're going to be really snowballing out of control it's good to have a lot of strategies but you also need some strategies which are hammer-esque what do i mean by that i mean you need some things like you can just pound people with um where you're not like obsessing about every little minute counter right where you can just hit people with the goddamn hammer and that is what this is this is one of the hammers of vettiheim and what we're doing is we're getting Moss Body and Luck and Quickness and Cheat Fate and Body Ethereal uh, on basically all of our guys. And we're abusing... not abusing. Uh, we have them all on Guard Commander, which normally is a problem because it means they're not going to be able to run in. Um, in our case, um, we can deal with that by casting Touch of Madness. Later in the game, we'll be able to do Growing Fury on entire armies. But for now, it's Touch of Madness. And, you know, like, some of the tech we've got, like, I've got, uh, uh whatchamacallit, uh, like, alt-7 alt stuff with mass protection on the Abyssia army, and on the Vettiheim army, this stuff is all, I think I did wooden warriors, but if I didn't do that, I just did protection, which you can totally do. It's really alt-4 stuff, and that's it, like, I don't even have, it. oh, and Touch of Madness, I think, is Dom three or four or five. I think it's three, but it may be five. And yeah, let's, if we take a look at the, some of these guys at the front, I don't think got the full buff cycle, but I'm pretty sure these guys got, oh, I think
think I had a few too many mages. So they didn't all get all... Like, this guy has all the buffs. So he's got Ethereal. He's got Lucky. He's got Twist Fate. He's got Moss Body. And he's had Berserk Triggered. If we look at his stats from all this, because he also had Wooden Warriors applied to him. Uh, his Natural Protection is 12. Um, which is basically the 10 from Wooden Warriors plus Berserk. Um, and then he has... These guys actually have decent armor, uh, the Betty Berserkers. So anyway, you can see he's 21 protection. With Moss Body on top of it, uh, it's a bit crazy. It's a bit cray. And he's going to be hitting very often very hard. Uh, in the late game, this gets worse. Not only will it be on more troops, but we're going to have more buffs at our disposal. It's going to be easier for us to buff strength, which on a two-handed weapon like this is going to kick this up to about 29 damage. Um, yeah. There's some things we're vulnerable to a little bit more in the late game, but we'll talk about that later. But you can see these guys are surrounded by heavy infantry who hit very hard, like 19 damage. And again, this is alt 4. And what I'm showing you here is not ultra killy infantry or not like... You know, it's not anything amazing on Abyssia's side. Um, but we actually will do pretty okay against all that. Like, even if, like, the, the higher quality stuff you bring against something like this, in some ways the worse it is. Because these guys are still going to kill it. You know, like, some of these guys haven't gone berserk because they, for whatever reason, we don't have enough touch-up madness going on. But, um... And it's a, there's a little kind of funny thing with this, which is you actually... I think I might have brought a few too many troops. You actually don't want too many troops, because you don't want to dilute the buffing. So I probably brought, like, five too many troops. But you can see they're just... they're chewing through, and we didn't get Touch of Badness on enough people. But, anyway, it's not really gonna matter. So this is an example of it not working well. Of basically it being poorly scripted. And hopefully, in the series, we're going to have much better scripted, because I'm going to put more time into it. But this is the right concept. Like, if we look at it, what didn't happen, we should have gotten Touch of Madness off on all these idiots. So I think the, the trick is, we just would have brought fewer troops, 5, 10 fewer troops, but had all the buffs on them, including Touch of Madness, and it would have gone better. Um, and so if we look at the battle report, uh, it was basically 250 dudes that we killed with... This is... Okay, never mind. This is a thousand gold, and then this is this is like a thousand five hundred gold. Um, and if we brought fewer troops, actually, it would have been better. Like I was saying, so probably like a thousand five hundred gold can kill indiscriminately large amounts of stuff. It's sort of vulnerable to some things. Like it's kind of vulnerable to trample. It's kind of vulnerable to some area of effect stuff. But a lot of that we can actually protect against. Area of effect cold stuff we're already resistant to. Area of effect heat stuff. Um, once we get not very far in alteration, well, I already have a research, but once we get not very far, I think it's alt 5, we get access to, um, where are we? Fire resistance. And this would be a little tricky. We have to either do two gems on a water 2, or we have to jump at a communion. But this will like really help with fire elementals and stuff. And we get this early. This is something we're going for anyway. And I haven't even gone through uh, the like the actual units we get, so I think we're going to do a more proper review of all the units. I just wanted to show you... I wanted to prime you to think about the context, because when I'm talking about the Vetti Berserker, you're going to be like, oh, it's not that good. No, no, no. It is ridiculous. It is absolutely mind-blowingly ridiculous. All right? So, uh, what is this nation? Um, this is a nation of gobos. It is a nation of goblins. And it is pretty cool. It's pretty cool. What defines it? It's got pretty low morale stuff. Um, all of it's size 1. And size 1 is a blessing and a curse because you have amazing attack density. On the other hand, uh, well, you get trampled by stuff really easily. You get wiped out by air of effect things pretty easily. And, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the main things, right? So the, the, the blessing and the curse of density. And 
yeah, they're they're pretty darn amazing. Um, almost everything is stealthy, and like I said, that doesn't have great morale. Um, and so I, I think this nation does a pretty good job in how it's designed in terms of giving you the feel of these little forest goblins that are just running around everywhere, popping up, causing you all sorts of problems. And they're sort of organized. You know, it's not like the, the Oni or something where they're unrest causing, you know, little hooligans. Uh, this is These are little organized tribes of, of goblins. And yeah... But, so they're not undisciplined in general, um, but they also don't have great leadership and they don't have great morale. So it's it's a kind of cool thing. Um, we, oh, one second, let me turn, I've got one of it. This damn debug mod is, I don't know why, but sometimes it hoses up. Um, I was changing this unit to a debug sensei. Anyway, um, we're going to go through all the units now. Um, but yeah, basically stealthy, not great morale, not undisciplined though. Um, death, nature, blood, water, astral, you get lots of that. Um, they prefer cold scales. Um, and they're going to get access to a bunch of the Niflheim-esque uh, magic spells that they can, you know, the, the national uniques. Uh, including they can summon Niflheim Jarls uh, once they get ill winter up. So, um, without further ado, we'll get into the actual units. We have the Vidi Archer. Archers in late age tend to suck. That's just kind of a thing. They kind of suck. Armor's too thick. They don't do much. If you're fighting a nation that has a lot of really chaffy chaff, you may want archers if you have stuff like Flaming Arrows, which we don't really have. I, I don't think there's a lot of great uses for the Vidi Archer. We're going to move on. Um, next up, we have the Light Vedi Infantry. Um, we're going to have a few of these Vedi Infantry, and uh, what's notable is they, they hardly cost any resources, so you can really crank these guys out. And they have very high attack density. Decent defense, but not great. Um, and then the shield means they can kind of handle some archer fire, but they also still kind of get wrecked by crossbows, because it's not a great shield. You basically have a spear and a a hatchet variety. I think in the late age where you tend to have more armor, the hatchet's not going to be as good. Ha the hatchet is going to do like 20% more damage after armor, but the problem is this isn't going to get through a lot of armor. Whereas this is going to reduce 20% of armor uh, and then do damage. And I think that's going to be mostly better in the late age. So we have the Vedi Spearmen. We have the Vedi Crossbowmen, which is pretty cool. It's got, first of all, an 11 damage crossbow, which is pretty good. It's right at the 9 strength for threshold, which means if it was 8, I think it would go down to 10. I could be wrong. But um, this is a high damage crossbow. It is on a stealthy unit uh, that has force survival, which is kind of nice. It means it's reasonably... Well, okay, never mind. It's not really that great a mobility. But it's uh, yeah, stealthy crossbows are really good. And the reason is you can get them in and out of sticky situations... And you can have them pop up when they're not expected. And having a bunch of crossbows pop up can be really nice, especially, especially if you're thinking about um, that your army may be... Like, if the enemy's not expecting it, so they're not putting arrow fend up because you haven't been using them, and your army's fluffed up with stuff like luck and with body ethereal, which... Luck, you can, in the late game, get this on every single unit. Body Ethereal, less so. But that's going to help. Just having luck on everything is going to greatly reduce your the friendly fire casualties from Crossbow. So anyway, I, I think this is a very solid unit. One of the cheapest Crossbows in the game. And it's size 1. Um, yeah. It's pretty good. It's pretty darn good. Uh, next up, we have uh, the Light Vetti Infantry. Uh, I'm not actually 100% sure how that's different than the Vedi Spearman. One second. Oh, Vedi Spearman's higher resource cost. The light... So this guy, the Light Vedi Infantry, with the hatchet, that's the guy you compare to this, the Light Vedi Infantry with the spear. Right? And then, of the heavier armored dudes, we have the Spearman, 12, um, and he's got a nice big shield. Uh, we compare that... Because I think... Oh, no, it's the same shield. Um, we compare that kind of to this guy, who's got 15 armor, and uh, but has a broadsword for 15 damage. 
And 15 damage is a bit more than the hatchet with 14. So I think it's a bit more of a contest. Like, if you're going to do the heavily armored dude, do you do this guy? Or do you do this guy? That said, the other guy has 15 armor, which is going to be nice. It's going to be pretty helpful versus things like... Basically versus indies. It is going to make a nice difference. But the other guy is imminently more spammable. He's... This guy's almost about 30% more cost in terms of gold and resources, which is what's going to constrain you most likely early on. So, I don't know. These guys are good. Uh, and having shielded stuff is pretty good uh, in the late age because you're going to be dealing potentially with a ton of crossbows. And crossbows are going to be things which will really, really ruin the day of, in my opinion, the absolute star of the show for Vettiheim, which is the Berserker. Um, and because of that, you potentially want to set up crossbow screens uh, of these dudes so that these guys can get all buffed up. Once these guys get buffed up, they don't really care about crossbows. Before they get buffed up, they kind of do. Um, so the, the Vetti Berserker, let's talk about him. Uh, decent protection, 13. Okay hit points, 8. I mean, it's bad hit points, but worse than human, and it costs more than a human. Uh, otherwise, the stats look reasonably normal. 12 MR is okay. I'm actually not sure how the MR for all these guys is. 12. Okay, these guys actually have pretty good MR. 12 is above average. Um, the morale is not great. The morale is only 10. And that's one of the things, if we go back, some of these have really bad morale. This guy has 9. I think the archer is 7. Yeah. And 10 is not great. And is on the low end. And we one of the things is we don't have leaders that are above 60 leadership, which means we can't really get a plus one bonus. And all those things kind of combine. And the net combination of all of that is you're going to have your troops run a lot. And it's something to worry about. But anyway, um, these guys, the main thing that is really good about them is they have a length two, which is nice. Uh, it means you actually can get some a few repels um, on length one weapons, uh, battle axe, and it's two-handed, which means any bonus to strength is going to get you know twenty-five percent more damage. So this plus two, once they go berserk, they're going to be strength of two of uh, twelve, um, which will give them. I think when they go berserk, this goes up to twenty-four if I recall, to get three three bonus damage from the Berserk. And that is now very hard hitting, and it's going to be 14 attack. And the attack density is absolutely phenomenal. Um, their defense, they're going to get hit all the time, but as we see, if we get their protection up, it's not as much of an issue. They were extremely tanky. And this is all for 12 gold. On top of it, it's stealthy. Um, the thing I want to kind of point out is that that party that I showed you, which was just super budget cheap, took almost no gems. Um, that was a party that we could have sneaking around, popping up anywhere. There's no amount of PD. Like, I, I just showed you an 80 PD dump, right, with high quality stuff with mass, mass protection put on top of it. There's no amount of PD that these guys are going to give a shit about. Once you have them with mage support in proper raiding squads, no amount of PD. And if your enemy wants to fight them with a like a proper army, it better be a strong proper army, or they better have like mass air elemental spam or mass fire elemental spam or something like that, right? Or like very good sacred troops. Like just dealing with it is going to be so difficult. These guys are so good, and if they start fielding that kind of stuff, you just go stealthy and you don't fight it. In my opinion, this guy is the complete absolute star of the show. One thing to think about is uh, if you're fighting in the encumbrance is going to be a bit of an issue especially if you get quickness on them which in my opinion you want uh, and because the encumbrance can be a bit of an issue you want to think about things like relief uh, you also want to think about like getting fire resistance on them if you're fighting in heat um, but yeah that's it's that's another thing to kind of think about with these dudes um, because once this triggers basically they're going to get the four encumbrance uh, and then they're also going to get an additional fatigue every turn from Berserk. Uh, next up, we have the Wolf Riders uh, and the Wolf Brothers. And these are 15 gold, and they're, the Wolf Brothers are 20 gold. Um, these dudes only have 8 protection, and then they have a 10 attack, 12 damage spear and bite. 
If we compare that to these dudes, they have an 11 attack, which is significant. Um, and they have, what, three more armor? Oh no, five more armor. So a lot more armor on these guys. Um, I, Yeah, they, they all have shields, so they're going to do sort of okay to light archer fire. Um, this guy also has two more defense than this dude, which is, I think, the biggest difference, honestly, between the chassis. Um, between the extra protection and the extra defense, these guys really do last a lot longer. What's cool about both of them is that they're a cavalry unit, which is size 2. Um, in addition, what's cool about them is when they die, they turn into a wolf. Um, like the They basically get dismounted and you have a wolf. The wolf they're dead after combat. I don't think the, the riders get replaced. Um, but the wolf will help... It'll delay HP routing on your side, which is a major deal for goblins because your guys are always kind of wanting to run. So anyway, you have both of these. They can be gotten in fort. Or this guy, the wolf rider, can be gotten in forts. The wolf brother you can only get, I'm sorry, in forests. The wolf rider can only be gotten, or can be gotten in forests without a fort. The wolf brothers recruit anywhere, but you need to have a fortress built. Um, they can pillage. I can't. Yeah, these guys can pillage too. And pillaging, if you have the, it's kind of weird they call it pillaging here, an effective pillager. What this also means is they can raid, um, which is a very, very, very good way of getting out of wars that you don't want to be in. Somebody thinks they're going to attack you and you really don't want them to. You can start pillaging and raiding their land. And that is a pretty decent way to get them to fuck off. If you'll excuse my French. Um, because unless somebody's going to win a decisive war against you, having a lot of your land burnt to the ground is a pretty good incentive to not. Um, that said, they also make pretty decent raiders, but you tend to suffer reasonably high attrition. We're going to talk a little bit about ways to raid with these guys. One of the things, I, in my opinion, one of the other ways to kind of be a very strong nation is to have very good timings and synergy within, like there's... If you have to do a bunch of different things in terms of research to be able to unlock a lot of core strategies, then it's going to be problematic because all those timings on getting those researches are going to be kind of delayed. Um, one of the nice things about Vettiheim is they get such good things going down alteration. And one of them, I think alteration and construction are the two things that are really important for them. And one of the reasons is because with Construction 4, you can start making Thistle Maces, and you stick them on these guys, and then they can drop Wooden Warriors. And these dudes with Wooden Warriors drop on, dropped on them actually become quite formidable. Um, they're going to basically jump up to 18 protection. And uh, you can also, because you've got the Thistle Mace, potentially get enlarged on a few of them, which is going to increase the damage output. Um, but yeah, these guys are quite effective PD raiders once you get wooden warriors. In my opinion, they're also effective without it. And you can use these for expansion. In my estimation, they tend to suffer a reasonably large amount of attrition um, without any kind of buffs on them. Um, in armies, they make very good flankers. They have very high combat speed. Um, and so they're worth using for that. I mean, even if they generally are going to die every time, if the, the few times it will work, if they take out a mage core, it can completely turn a fight around. So anyway, that's the wolf brother. Um, next up, we have the Rimvedi. And the Rimvedi are pretty interesting. They, in many ways, are a tiny Nifl Jarl. And they're size one, um, as things are in Vediheim. They're sacred. They have uh, cold resistance 25. They have a chill aura. They have snow move which I, we actually need to go back through and see who all has snow move. Uh, Berserkers don't, and they're only map move 10. These guys do, and they're map move 18. These guys do map move 18. I think most of our other Vedi do not. Which, that's pretty important, because if you want to get... Basically, the threshold for starting to have fast movement, like map move 2, is you're going to need to be map move 12, and you're going to need to have snow move. And these guys actually hit that. So these guys are going to be map move 2 inside... Uh, well, I mean, basically they're going to be map move 2 in a lot of situations unless they're going over for it. I mean, uh, mountains or... 
uh, swamps or wastelands or something. But, um, okay, continuing on. They're stealthy. Um, they have force survival, which is nice. They have cold power one, which is phenomenal on a size one. And cold three, which is what your dominion should be. Uh, it's, I think it should be. Um, they're going to be strength uh, 13. So this is going to be an 18 damage attack. And then they're going to be attack um, th uh, 15, which is going to make this a 16 attack. And then they're going to be defense 18. So very hard to hit. In addition, they have cold protection 2. Which means uh, the way this works for cold protection is this, our ice protection, it applies to the armor, not to the natural protection. So it's going to kick their armor protection, not this number, this one. It's going to kick this up 6. So this is going to go to 20. So they're going to be 20 protection in cold 3, which is obviously crazy. And then we start stacking on this other stuff we were doing with... Uh, like bark skin. Well, that's going to get them up to about 25 now. So anyway, this potentially, without any bless or anything, can be a 25 protection unit in cold 3 that's going to be hitting for 18 damage with 16 attack. And it's going to have 18 defense. And that's for 24 gold. So those are pretty darn amazing, I would have to say, without like no bless at all. We're not even looking at that yet. Pretty amazing. One thing that is a bit of a problem with these guys is uh, because they don't go berserk, you can't do that same cheese I was talking about before. With these guys, you're only going to get really... There is some things you can do. and The thing that you can do is you basically put these guys on guard commander and you send the commander in and they just follow around and try to keep up with them. If you want to get a long buffing script off. And I think that's the right way to handle it with these guys in this particular setup. Um, but I, th I think the other thing that's like super important about them is the map move too. I think that's actually like probably the most important part about them compared to the other guys and the magic weapon. Um, these guys are going to be pretty bad, needless to say, in Heat 3. So... But, you know, in Heat 3, they're going to get minus 3 to all these, which means they're hardly going to do any damage. They'll never hit. They'll get hit all the time, and their protection is going to be hot garbage. Their protection is going to be like 8 or something, right? It's going to be bad. These guys are like worse than Militia in Heat 3, all right? So don't don't use them that way. The Chillara is nice. The other thing, Size 1 with Chillara, they are going to freeze things very quickly. If people are attacking you, they're probably going to have cold resistance, in my case, we're going to be playing in the game. People know I think Vettiheim is strong. Uh, there's a very good chance most everybody's going to have cold resistance in their bless. So, but little do they know, I don't even give a shit about cold resistance. Like, that is not my thing. Right, we're just, we're going to punch you to death with berserkers. Um, cold resistance will help you none. All right. Um, then we have the Moose Rider. These guys are kind of interesting. I think they, they serve a few purposes. They're decent HP sinks on the battlefield. Like, they're going to keep you from HP routing if you can keep them kind of safe. Um, Like, the crossbows are kind of bad because they don't get any strength bonus. So, like, your normal crossbows are a lot more cost-effective because for 25 gold, you would get like three and a half crossbows, which is going to be a lot better than a crossbow and a short bow. And the crossbows are going to do 11 damage, which is a lot better than eight damage. A lot. Because, like, it's probably at least double the damage when you factor in all the protection and stuff. Because, uh, you know, an 11 damage crossbow isn't going to actually do 11 damage a lot of the times because, you know, of armor and shields and things like that. You know, it's going to do like four, but this probably might do two on average or something. Um, and my math can be a little wrong there. But anyway, it's it's a big difference, 11 and 8. Um, they're decent in melee. I, I, I don't really love these guys for any stat other than the hit points. Um, there's possibly other things you would want to use them for. I just can't really think of what they are right now. Next up, we have the, the Jotun units. The Jotun units. And they are the Hurler, which is 
notable for having amazing, like absolutely amazing gold to seed strength ratio. 10 of these guys, which costs you only 300 gold, will destroy a, a hundred well strength a turn. I mean, it is absolutely crazy. It's absolutely bonkers. And, it, you know, seed strength is not something we struggle with on this nation because these guys, like the Berserkers, they have 10 strength. They're like a normal thing. The problem in late age, though, is forts are really hard to crack. So in, like, middle age or early age, you know, like these guys, you could have 100 of them pop up on a palisade and knock it down. And, you know, a normal fort, you could have 150 of them in, like, a 250-wall fort. You know, they would knock it down in two turns, and that would be fine. Um, but in late age, there's a lot of like 700 wall strength forts and you really don't like, even if you have an army of like 200, which would be a big bit, like a very big Vetti Berserker army, you don't want to sit on top of a 700 wall fort for like, you know, four turns. The simple solution is bring along some of these dudes. And in my opinion, the best way to put these is on guard commander. They do have um, a very, very potent um, boulder attack. And this is decent, actually. It's The precision is high enough, and, and the range, what it mostly is, is the range is short enough. So it's only seven range, so they have to get close. And by the time they're close, they're going to mostly hit, because their precision is greater than their range, which is one of the things to kind of look at. So because their precision is greater than their range, they're going to hit a lot. They don't have a ton of ammo. I think it's, yeah, two. And then they'll charge into melee. They do a fair amount. I mean, they're not a bad unit. They, If you get them buffed up, they're pretty okay. Um, Like, honestly, these guys just with wooden warriors are going to be pretty good. You do have to worry on all these Jotun units about shock resistance. So things like small air elementals and stuff will murder them. But uh, the main purpose for these is potentially using the boulder if you have... Uh, protection-based thugs that these guys can help delete, or mostly just the seed strength. And then we have these guys, the Jotun Axemen. Um, a lot of people don't like them, so there's problems with them. One of the, the first problem is this is one of the few units for Vettiheim which is truly a high resource cost. Like if you look at the ratio of uh, resources to recruitment points, this is way higher than any other thing on on the Vettiheim roster. And there is a I would say a large school of thought for Vettiheim that you should be dumping um, productivity and taking sloth. And if you do that, you're basically never going to be able to afford them. So how good or you know not good they are is irrelevant if you can't even make them. Um, if you take productivity, however, you have the option to make them. And um, that begs the question then, should you? And in my opinion, I actually like them. I was trying to figure out expansion with Vettiheim. I was trying a bunch of things, and I was having high attrition, I wasn't really in love with it. And these guys, in my opinion, greatly improved expansion. They were one of the ones that really, really, really made a difference for me. And I, I don't think... I've talked to a lot of people, some really good players who have played Vettiheim. I think every good player that I know who's played Vettiheim, I've pinged them about it. Um, and I've talked with people about how they've done expansion and this, that, and the other. And, um... Nobody has mentioned them, but I've tried everything that they've all said, and everybody has said it's janky. Doing Sloth, it, Sloth Scales expansion with Vettiheim is janky. It just is janky. These guys add a bit of stability to it. They do it for a few reasons. One is they have pretty good morale. Um, second is they have... Um, if you think about it, when you have this guy in a tile with two Berserkers, which is kind of how I recommend doing it, though I, I should probably also test it with two like Swordsmen or Spearmen or something with a shield. But if you have these guys in a tile with uh, two of them, they are going to take uh, two-thirds of the hits. The problem with these guys is they don't have very good attack density. right? So they're only going to be, at best, killing one unit a turn, and then their attack skill isn't that great, so they're not going to be killing that much. Um, mixing them in with Berserkers fixes that problem. It means that that tile that they are in is going to be having uh, four, I mean, uh, three attacks a turn. 
and they're all going to be like 20 plus damage attacks. So it's a pretty killy tile, a tile with the Jotun Axemen and then uh, Betty Berserkers in it. So what the what the Jotun Axemen gains out of that is they have completely fixed their attack density problem. What the Betty Berserkers gain out of it is two out of three hits are not going to be coming their way because when you have a tile only full of Betty Berserkers, if they're not buffed, which is likely going to be the case in expansion, um, they're they're going to be getting kind of wrecked. <laughs> uh, you just have such high attrition on unbuffed uh, Berserkers versus kind of anything, unless it's like a Thug, in which case the Thug will kill one and then he'll pop. But, you know, versus any quantity of units, the Vidi Berserkers do take a fair amount of damage. So that is how I see these guys. They are pretty good for basically providing a screen or a cover for Vetti Berserkers. They can handle crossbow fire reasonably well. They have very good protection. Um, and then they have enough HP that most fights, unless they get isolated, uh, they tend to not die in expansion. So I actually like these guys a lot. The other thing that's really nice about them is they have a very good gold to siege strength ratio. Um, you're basically getting one siege strength um, for every, like, what, eight gold? Seven gold? Um, and they have snow move uh, with map move 12. So these also are in the club of map move 2 through a lot of your terrain. They do not have force survive. So these guys do, and, and that is something to consider. Um, in summary, I like them. I like them. They can only be gotten in the capital, so you're not going to be having a tremendous amount of them. And same with the Hurler. And same, of course, with the Rim Betty. Moose Riders, should you so choose, you can get anywhere. Um, when we talk about... Okay, we're going to talk about the mages. Um, we're going to jump into it by talking about the most important one first, which is this, the Vedi Gaija. And oh boy, these are amazing. They are so good. They are so freaking good. Now, you may look at this and you may say, Lucid, what kind of drugs are you on? These don't look that good to me. They're, they have one water. Nobody likes one water that much. They are one death, which isn't enough to do garbage or anything. And they're one nature, which, you know, like, so are, like, a ton of things. When we look at their randoms, they could potentially be a water two. Nobody goes crying about how unbalanced water twos are. Water twos are one of your most important variety, though. Um, they come in an astral variety, which, okay... You know, the Astra one's obviously going to be good because now we can start getting into communions, but that's only one in four. And we've got five different varieties. Right, the death ones... Okay, the death ones probably suck, right? Because it's just a pretty expensive death two mage that has cross paths that aren't terribly useful, right? Um, the nature ones... Okay, we're paying 200 gold for a nature two. Like, that sounds really bad. And the blood ones... Okay, well, we've got now a bunch of things which aren't very good at path level one, right? No. Um, they basically are all awesome. All of these are awesome. Some of them are... They're all awesome in a little different ways. And that is... Talking about how these Vidigaija are good is what is going to... These completely make the nation... All right, I mean, the, them, it's a synergy thing. It's with the Vedi Berserkers and with the Rim Vedi. But if you didn't have this, the Vedi Berserkers would not work. These things would work with a lot of other things. Like, these things are the enablers to make a lot of other things work. But the Vedi Berserkers do not work on their own. All right? They require mage support. And that's just something to get your head around, I think, on this nation. I mean, you can use them on your own. We're going to show you, we're going to do expansion without mage support. But we're going to have reasonably high attrition. And to win wars, you don't want to be having high attrition. You win a war with high attrition with a nation where you're paying gold for troops. It's not very good. Okay. What do the Water Twos do? The Water Twos are going to be dropping quickness. That is their main thing. Quickness on size 1 units is going to blow your mind. It's so good. Right? We drop it on our Rim Vetti, We drop it on our Berserkers. Their whole job in life is just to drop quickness. That is all we care about. Note... Uh, once we get Construction 6 and we can make Water Bracelets, everybody can be a Water 2. And the Water 3s, um, I mean, and your Water 2s can become Water 3s, which means when you get high enough alteration, which I think is 8. Uh, is it 8? 
Yeah, you get quickening. Okay. The f and don't... I don't want you to look at the price tag for this. I don't care how much it... I mean, I care how much it costs, but 190 Think of it this way. If you're doing quickness on a size 2 unit, like maybe 190 is too expensive. But doing quickness on size 1 units, 190 is super cheap. All right? You're getting twice the value out of quickness as you would on most other nations. All right? So just don't obsess too much about the price tag. Death. You get death twos. Okay, what are the death twos good for? Well, we have this trick we can do with our Betty Gaija. And this is another reason they are the absolute linchpin of the nation. The other trick we can do is we can do twice born. And uh, we can also do transformation. And the, 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 the thing that makes this a trick is that twice born is going to be based on the cost of the unit. So this is going to only cost five gems to do twice born, which is ridiculously cheap. And don't feel like you have to do transformation after twice born. You can just twice born these guys and send them into combat. And if they die, boop, they come back. Okay, and I, I don't even think they're so good. I don't even think you would want to suicide them. I think if you're gonna deploy, if you have a, you're about to go on the offensive, just twice born your guys, and send them out. And if they die, then great, you you've got a bunch of white mages now. Um, if you you can totally suicide them too, especially in the mid game and late game, once you're gonna have a harder time finding ways to dispose of your Vidi Gaija. Um, but the death twos, especially you want a twice born because you're going to have a shot at getting a death three, uh, which is pretty cool. So I would say those get the priority on twice borning. Um, but they're also just going to be skelly spam, right? And you just, I mean, there's no fight where having a guy skelly spam is not going to be good. Uh, I would say you give him a skull staff, but honestly, you probably want to be spending more of your death gems on twice borning than you do on a skull staff. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the main thing for them. Though, it, I will point out, having Death Water opens up the option to go Stiggy and Reigns, uh, which is very good for your Rim Betty, not very good for your Berserker. So, anyway, it's an option. It's something that you want to think about with the Death Cross, with, like, with High Death and High Water. Uh, the Nature Randoms, again, you might say Nature 2s are expensive. No, I mean, they're awesome. All right, with the Thistle Mace, they can be Nature 3 if we want to do things like Mass Region and stuff later. Um, you also are going to be a nation that has pretty trivial access to armor of Twisting Thorns. So the Nature 2s potentially, with a few Blood Slaves, which you should have plenty of, um, and then a rather trivial 20 gem Nature Gem investment, um, become Nature 4. Uh, and now consider we may put that on a Twiceborn chassis, so now it's actually a good chassis. Um, and that may be a Twiceborn chassis that we've transformed, so it's actually a really good chassis. Um, we can have pretty budget... I mean, when you add up all the costs, I think transformation's like eight gems, and then the death twice born's like five. So now we're at 13. And then for the gear, you know, it would be 20. And then some blood slaves. But, you know, so like it's around like 35 gems um, to have, you know, potentially a very nice size four to six, which is what you're typically going to get, or what you're often going to get with uh, transformation and, and luck scales. You know, size four to six chassis that uh, is going to have nature four. Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty damn good. Uh, but even the nature twos, right? That that's like for high end stuff, right? That's that's the bougie stuff we're going to be doing late game. In the early game, uh, nature twos are twice born cast. I mean, not twice born. They're going to be um, wooden warriors casters, and they're just going to drop wooden warriors on as many like. Every little goblin they can see, they're going to drop wooden warriors on. Um, they also have the option to cast enlarge, which uh, normally enlarge is not something you're going to want to do always in these big fights because, like, in a, the bigger the fight is, the less likely you're going to want to do to uh, want to do enlarge because you you value the attack density. That being said, in your when in these buffing situations, enlarge actually can be good. But the thing is, you want to do it at the very end because you can have um, you can have more than six total size in a tile, but you can't move things into that tile with more than size six in it. And I know that sounds confusing. What I mean by that is, if you enlarge 
let's say there's six size one units in the tile and you enlarge them. All of a sudden there's 12 size, 12 size worth of units in the tile. They're not going to get kicked out of the tile. They get to stay there, which means it can still be targeted by the next buff, like uh, Touch of Madness. That said, when people are on Guard Commander, they're going to be wibble-wobbling around some. And so you'll have some guys walk out and they won't be able to get back in. Now, most of them are going to stay put, so over the course of like one turn, it's not going to be a huge difference, but that's why you want to do it at the end. But anyway, you can also do Enlarge. You can also do Army of Giants, though I think you need to be Nature 3 for that. You might be able to do it as a Nature 2. Yeah, a Nature 2 could do it, but for two gems. Um, and yeah, I think this is actually something you do want to do with Vettiheim. And again, this is pretty early. This is um, Alt-6. Uh, so yeah, all your Nature 2s can also do Army of Giants. Uh, your The Astral Randoms are very important. Just because Astral Mages are going to be really good. Um, the point buffing on Astral is phenomenal. We get Luck and we get Body Ethereal. Both those are really important. Body Ethereal is probably the most important thing if people are trying to do Air Elementals against you. So, like... Turn one, having like five or six mages drop ethereal to get all of your guys' body ethereal, really good. Um, <clears throat> and then following it up with luck, you'll actually survive air elementals kind of okay if you have people with magic weapons like your rim Betty to knock them out. Um, the problem is the air elementals are going to mess up your formation, so that it's going to decrease the effectiveness of all your buffing. It's air elementals are still going to be something that you have to worry about. Late Age, I feel, often is not a nation filled with air elementals, though. There's not a, a ton of huge air powers that I, I mean, there's some, like you have Bogarus who can kind of do it. I don't know. I, I, I tend to just not see it as much. I'll just say that. I, and it could be, I'm, it just is a factor of luck that it hasn't happened in most of the games that I've been in. Uh, but the Astral one's super important. The other important thing about Astral is they can jump in Communion and you can have arbitrarily high Water, Death, or Nature. So any of the big in-game buffs you want in Water, Death, or Nature, which includes things like Stygian Rains, includes all the, you know, Life After Death, um, all the Fatigue plays, it includes Foul Vapors. That's the other thing your Nature Randoms can do is you throw a Thistle Mace on them and then... Oh, actually, they don't even need a Thistle Mace. They can all do... All of these can do Foul Vapors, by the way, if they have a Thistle Mace. If they're a nature one, they can do it a gym cheaper. They're a nature random. Because uh, it's nature three, water one to cast with one gem, which means a water two can cast it with two gems. But if you're nature three, you can cast it with one. So anyway, that's something to keep in mind. The, the nature twos also, they can do poison ward, which is pretty important if you're going to be putting up foul vapors nice and early. Um, and it's also important um, if you're going to be doing moss body, which is something all these guys can do. And Moss Body is something you are definitely going to want to do in mass. It is worth thinking about, though, because when the Moss Body ends, it's going to explode in Poison. You really probably do want to get Poison Ward up um, before you start really laying down a ton of Moss Body, unless you're in a desperate situation. If you're in a desperate situation, it's still fun to use Moss Body. Um, blood Randoms. The blood randoms must be the bad one, right? Well, not really. You can blood hunt with them, which is nice. Um, they're not super efficient blood hunters. The hags are way better, but they're not bad. Uh, importantly, they can also jump in communions, doing Sabbath Master. Uh, if you take magic scales on Betty Heim, um, they jump in communions very easily. They don't, you know, they're not passed out as soon as they become Sabbath Masters or Sabbath Slaves. The other thing that's nice about blood, and this op is opened up as an option later in the game, is we have a fair amount of Astral, like one in five of these guys is going to be Astral, um, but that's not a ton. And if you're fighting an Astral Nation, they may get Magic Dueled so you can't ha reliably get your Communions off, and that could really screw with you. Well, you can just completely ignore having Astral in your Nation if you want to with the Blood, and you can say, I'm just going to pool all my Blood guys together, and we're going to just be running Sabbaths into an Astral enemy. And that's a pretty important use case, I think, for the Bloods. Um, the other thing is, and there's not many nations that can say this, but Vettiheim is a nation that has Astral and Blood. 
which, you know, it's not super common. And the important thing about that is you can wipe the fatigue out of your communions by doing reinvigoration. Blood is something that synergizes very well with astral. So if you have a primarily astral communion, just having one blood master can make a huge difference in how long it can run. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty darn good. Uh, there's probably other things that we can talk about here in terms of what rituals we can get off, like what are all the blood... Like, there's certainly good blood death things you can do, like bone fiends. There's good blood water stuff you can do, like ice devils, so you're going to need a lot of boosters. There's good blood nature things you can do, like rain of toads, uh, armor of twisting thorns. Uh, there's, you know, uh, foul, foul spawn. I forget this spell you get that from. But anyway, there's a lot of things we can do. The, the, the thing I want to say in closing about these guys, in some ways they're the master of point buffs. There's so many point buffs we can do with these guys, it is phenomenal. And they, you two out of five of them can jump in communions. All right, so you're going to have plenty of mages to jump in communions. And the ones that don't jump in communions are super useful on their own. The water twos, I, trust me, you're not going to get tired of casting quickness. The death twos, having a bit of free spawn never hurt anybody with the, uh, not free spawn, but just combat summons of skeletons. And the nature ones are your best buffers. So all of these are phenomenally useful. Um, one more thing to say, and I know I said that was in closing, but I just keep having more to talk about. These guys are map move 10, um, and they're old. If we look at why they're map move 10, they're base map move 14, actually, which is really good. But they get a penalty from old age and a penalty from armor. Um, also of note is they do not have snow move. And what that means is even if you were to get rid of the old age, uh, which they're not actually very old, by the way, so they don't get, they have a pretty good survival rate through winter. Um, if you get rid of the old age, uh, they're going to become map move 12, but they're not going to actually be able to move map move 12 because they're going to be too damn slow uh, in the snow. And I'll, we'll just show that real quick. I'm going to pause it. All right. So I've got, I just made a quick Vidiheim test game. Uh, and we should be able to go, these are mountains, so they don't hurt movement. Um, we should be able to go, one second, let me get somebody with snow move. Uh, we should be able to move all the way over here. Like, it's only 12 move. It's 6 move per province, so we should be able to get all the way over here. This guy has snow move, right? For the uh, for the Gaija, it's 8 per tile, so it would be 16 to get all the way from here to here. Um, and I think this is pretty important. Why do I think it's important? It's because I think these units are really good. They're, they're the linchpin of the entire Vettiheim thing. Right, so having these guys limited to map move two in many ways is going to limit the entire nation to map. I mean, having these guys limited to map move one is often going to limit the entire nation to map move one. Uh, and being able to move two with these guys means you can organize some really incredible defenses uh, where people may not be expecting it. So, yeah, there. I think that's one of the the downsides of of the guy just is. They're only map move one. Let's pull them back up. Now, you can get rid of this, and we'll talk about this more in the Pretender Design episode, but they... Um... Okay, sorry about that. To, to get rid of this, you actually have to do two things. Uh, you have to get rid of uh, unaging, because that's going to be one of the constraints. Uh, you have to get rid of their old age with unaging. Uh, that's going to be one of the constraints. So this will get rid of the minus two penalty. Alternatively, you could just give them an armor that uh, is going to have zero movement penalty, and therefore you wouldn't really need to get rid of the this. You could also just give them boots or something. Um, the other thing that you kind of need to do, almost more importantly than getting rid of this two penalty or adding movement is you need to get uh, snow move on them. So 
and because I think you kind of want to have a lot of like you can deploy so many of these parties and you're going to want so many Vedi Gaija that relying on items for movement, I don't know. It seems a bit tricky. I kind of like, I like the idea of taking unaging and you're blessed, which will mean you won't lose any as attrition uh, from old aging stuff. Uh, they're also going to have slightly better stats, uh, which is kind of nice, but not super important. Um, and you're going to have uh, map move two if you take Winner's Gift also. So that's going to give you snow move. It's nice to take both of them. I don't know if it's optimal, um, and it's expensive in terms of things you might otherwise choose to do with your pretender, but it's a thing. You, it's something you could choose to do. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about our other mage, and we'll go back and talk about the commanders. We have one more mage after this, actually. But we have the Jotungaija, and this is cap only. Um, it's old age, and this is hard-coded in. So even if you take an unaging bless, you will not get rid of the old age. Though you will decrease the rate at which they get afflictions and stuff, because they're going to age more slowly. Uh, they're fortune teller 10. I think these guys are fortune teller 5. Memory serves. Oh, no, they're not. Okay, so they're Fortune Teller 10, which is actually pretty nice. Get rid of bad events. Um, <clears throat> why would you ever get these if you have the Vedi Gaijo? That is a decent question. And uh, that's how I'm going to attempt to answer it, because you have to look at these completely within the context of this is a nation that already has the Vedi Gaijo. Um, the Vedi Gaijo are 190, and these guys are a whole hundred gold more expensive. A whole hundred gold. Uh, so what is it that they're going to bring to the table that's going to make it worth it? Well, to start off with, they have the same base paths. Or not the same. They get the blood instead of nature. Now, that is significant for one reason. Um, or maybe for many reasons, but at least for one. One of the reasons that's significant is because literally every single one of these guys will be able to jump in communions with uh, being a Sabbath slave or master. The other thing is these guys potentially can make very good turbo communion chassis. Um, if you're willing, I, you could choose to take a region bless on this nation. I, I don't think it's necessarily a great idea, but you could choose to do it. You know, if you do, and then you get personal region on them, and then you get enlarge on them or something, you know, enlarge will kick them up where they're going to be getting probably like 10 HP a turn with 20% region or 9 HP a turn. Which means you can start supporting very large Turbo Communion batteries. They're not very large, but large. You know, like nine Communion Masters doing whatever the hell they want. Um, that's pretty impressive. Um, that would be a compelling argument to take a Region Bless. Because a Region Bless is also going to be good on our twice-born Vedi Gaijas. Uh, that come back as White Mages. Because those are not lifeless, so they benefit from it. So there's a reasonably strong argument for for regen just from from that alone and you're going to have enough of these guys out of your capital that these will not really be the constraint for running turbo communion batteries it's going to be how many masters you can afford to put on top of it so that's one use for them it's just as a turbo communion battery and that's something the Vedi Gaija do not do well in their current form. They do it better in their twice-born form, where they're going to have a lot more HP. Um, that being said, there is also an argument to be made for reforming. I mean, for reforming flesh, because if you twice-born your Vedi Gaijas and you have some of them come back as large white mages, and they don't even have to be that big—just size four something—gets them up to forty HP. You can also get personal region on them and then they can also serve as convenient batteries so filling your head with ideas you can't do everything like you can't do the unaging i mean you could but it's expensive um so anyway that's i think that's the main use of them without looking at these randoms uh, looking at the randoms we see that they get basically the exact same five randoms that the vidi gaija get but they get two of them uh, and then they have a 10% chance of getting it again. We're, we'll ignore the 10% chance for now. Just looking at these, we have the possibility to get uh, Water 2, which is not special, because we can already get Water 2 on our Vedi Gaijas. 
we have the possibility to get death three. This is the highest we can get. And potentially we can twice run our death three and get death four. Um, that I think is pretty important. Um, and it's, it's probably the only real time I would think about twice spawning the Jotungeiges because generally it's going to be way more expensive. It's going to be four times as expensive as twice spawning a Vedi Gaija. But rolling at a death four, because death four is the level of death where you start breaking into high death. Because uh, with the Skull Staff, you get to death five, and then with the death five, you can do the Skull Face and get to death six. Anyway. <sighs> So it's possibly worth... It's an expensive dice roll. It's 20 death gems. Um, but you're also going to be getting rid of the upkeep. You're going to be getting a very good chassis. And uh, you're potentially going to get a chance at death four. So the death threes are going to be rare. They're going to be... You're, it's only really going to happen one in 25 times. So it's not very likely. But if you make these out of your capital pretty much all game you'll start getting, you know, you'll probably get one or two of them. The nature randoms, like if you get, if you roll snake eyes on nature, then you're going to be nature three, which is going to be our highest nature access. And that's pretty unlikely. It's pretty darn toot and unlikely. Um, but uh, if you do get it, you can get a very high nature with it because we're going to be able to get armor of twisting thorns and a thistle maze that gets us up to nature five. At which point you can do the tree lord staff, which will get you up to nature six. And then once we have construction six, we can also do moonvine bracelets, which will get us up to nature seven. So these guys potentially with a shit ton of nature gems um, and some time uh, could potentially be nature seven. <laughs> right? So that's a little crazy. Um, and to get that high, you might not need to be nature three to start. No, you don't. Because you but you'll have to you have to get the moonvine bracelet, which is something this nation can do. But the nature threes are pretty nice. Um the death randoms we talked about, the blood randoms, these are your highest blood, uh potentially getting up to blood three. But they're also going to give you a pretty reliable stream of blood twos, which is not something you're gonna be getting on the Betty Gaija. Um, the other thing that's worth noting about the Bloods is we're going to have a reasonable amount of Blood Astrals, which opens up things. It'll be expensive for us, because unless we get... Uh, I mean, all the Astrals are going to be Blood Astral, right? But you're going to have some that are going to be either Astral 2 in Blood or um, Astral 1, Blood 2. Those are going to be pretty nice for doing Send Lesser Horror and stuff like that. So that gives us stuff to do there with, uh, with Blood Slaves. Um, and then getting up to Blood 3, well, we could make the uh, Armor of Twisting Thorns and the Blood Thorn, and now we're up to Blood 5, which opens up the big Blood Boosters, like Armor of Souls and the, uh, the Brazen Vessel, right, which would get us up to, if we had the Blood 3 and then both of those would be 5 and then 6, so we could potentially get up to Blood 6. So these guys can be pretty powerful blood mages also. And of course they can get you all of the cross so they can get you, you know, uh vampire lords and they can get you I'm sorry, my dog's doing weird things. Second. So, yeah, the blood blood stuff's good. Astral uh I I don't think I talked about it in enough detail. Uh Astral it, you have a chance, a very small chance of getting Astral 3, but you have a pretty good chance of getting Astral 2, which means you can get up to Astral 3 with the Starshine Skullcap. The real reason you're going to make Veti Gaija is to get Death 3s, to get Nature 3s, to get Astral 2s, and to get Blood 3s. And it's going to take you a long time to get one of each of those, because but it's not going to take you that long to get one of one of those, if that makes any sense. And in my opinion, they are good enough that you're going to probably want to keep rolling them in your capital until you get enough. And a lot of these are useful because they can all be used as turbo communion uh, batteries and stuff. I think they're basically... You're, you're, you can always find a use for these dudes. You can always find a use. So I do think they are worth repeat recruiting in your capital. Now... 
we have a few other units uh, that we need to talk about. We need to talk about the Vedi, uh, the Vedi Hag. These you can get in uh, any forest with a lab. And labs are cheap to build in a forest, only 250 gold. And in some ways, you don't even want to fort forests because you have these, and if you fort it, you lose production of them. I think, or no, maybe... I think you can still produce them if you make a... Maybe that is a reason to actually fort it, then. You get more of them. Um, actually, I have to, to test that. But the water ones, frozen heart spammers, but otherwise probably the worst, uh, until you get construction six, and then they can also be quickness casters. Um, the Astral ones are probably the best, because they can jump in Communions, and you have all of the Astral point buffing. The Death ones um, are probably the, the actual worst, because um, you know, there's things they can do. They can do your Death Forging. They can uh, spam Dark Knowledge. Um, in a pinch, they can make a few Skeletons in combat, but it's not great. They're probably the worst. The nature ones are phenomenal, because they can do swarm, um, and then there's going to be a lot of nature point buffs we want to do, especially early in the game, like protection, just dropping that on a bunch of squares is really nice. Um, and then they're also going to be there to do touch of madness and stuff on your guys. So that's pretty nice. And the blood ones are going to be your cheapest blood hunters. So there's a lot of these that are... The astral, the nature, and the blood ones are all phenomenal. The water ones... Uh, they're okay in the later game, but they're probably going to be... The water and death ones are probably just lab rats, for the most part, in the early game. And the death ones are going to be your lab rats all game. But super duper good. Um, they do have inept researchers, so they're not great at researching, but they're 40 gold. Uh, and then magic scales, it's 40 gold for an 8 RP unit that doesn't take a lot of infrastructure. Oh, it's very good. Uh, we also get the Vedi Goad. They're also stealthy, too. They do not have snow move, though. And they're also old, but they're not very old. Uh, speaking of old, I don't think I mentioned these guys are old. They're pretty old. They're 330 out of 300. So, and they're hard-coded. I oh, know I did mention it, but they're, and they're also hard-coded hard -coded old. Uh, that said, there's still an argument for taking on aging because it's going to decrease the rate at which they get afflictions. I, I may have said that. I may have said it twice, but I've been kind of running back and forth, pausing this. Because of real life stuff. Um, the Vetti Goad. Um, these are 40 leadership. They can spend mage turns to do summon allies, which uh, you're going to get two wolves, so they're kind of like the the Ulm, like the late age Ulm unit, the wolf herd, where you can get two. This is the same ability. You get two wolf per turn for this. The difference is a fewfold. The Ulm guys are one commander point, but you can only get them out of your capital, and they're also really cheap. Whereas these guys are, I think, at least are about twice the cost um, and twice the commander points. But you can get them everywhere. So if you wanted to go, like, do a wolf, like a wolf strategy, you you know, this, you could do it. You could do it. And maybe in the late game there's an argument for it when you're, you know, the research is not a thing anymore. But every other point in the game, I don't think you want it. <laughs> And it's just nice, kind of, I don't know. I, I like free spawn a lot. I just don't really see it on this guy. It's too expensive. Um, that being said, you know, if you're going to be summoning wolves anyway to do your blood hunting, it may be worth it to have, you know, 10 of these guys who, when you need to, you can turn them on to get, you know, 20 wolves a turn to help with your blood hunting operations. I would probably just rather have them research and just do summon wolves, which they can cast themselves. But anyway, it it's, depends on how valuable you think your mage turns are. Um, the other thing about them is they're stealthy. They're a nature leader. They have high map move, so they can roll with... Rolling around with the wolf brothers and this guy with the thistle mace, it's going to be pretty strong. Um... They're going to be pretty good raiders. They're going to be highly mobile. They're going to be really good at flanking. And they can pop up kind of wherever you want them to. So I actually, I like these kind of a lot. Um, that said, I tend, the problem with making them is you're going to be making them in forts. And they're going to be competing directly with the Vedi Gaija. And when you compare them, would I rather have this guy or would I rather have this guy? 
The only main benefit of this dude, there's two. One is she only has 10 leadership and this guy has 40. So for actually leading a raiding party, uh, this guy in some ways is better. Um, he also can participate in these little fluff shenanigans we're doing if he needs to by doing protection and by touch of madness. So, you know, he has stuff he can do uh, in there too. He can also bless things if you're, if you're bringing Rimvedi. So, you know, he's important for that. These guys can also bless, obviously. But um, <clears throat> I think the main reason to get them is the high mobility leading these dudes uh, in, in raiding and then in conducting defensive things. They're just highly mobile, and that's pretty nice. <sighs> Uh, I think they're going to be map move. They should be map move three, kind of, in snowy terrain if they're not getting, like, a movement penalty from something else. Because it's going to be 18 movement through three plane styles with snow move. Um, and then that's going to also include forests and mountains, but not highlands. So anyway, there's going to be a lot of places these guys are going to be map move three. And if you're dealing with, especially with getting coalitioned where you need to knock one army out after another or something like that, um, being able to force concentrate with these guys is a pretty big advantage. So I don't know how many of them you want, but I think having at least one of them, like at least one pack of, I don't know, this guy with like 20 or 30 uh, of Wolf Brothers kind of supporting him would be pretty darn good. Pretty darn too good. But because these guys tend to have high attrition, I wouldn't have more of them than you have Thistle Maces, and I probably wouldn't prioritize them too much until you have wooden warriors. I think that, in my opinion, that's when these really come online. Um, and then we have the Vetti Hearse, which is basically the same thing. Uh, before you have the Thistle Mace and wooden warriors, these guys are going to do just as fine of a job. Um, the difference with these is you can also get them in all forests without having a fort built. So you're going to probably be making some of these just for that. Um, but yeah, before you have Wooden Warriors and Thistle Maces, uh, you can have these guys, and they can lead the Wolf Riders, who are also made in just forests. And enough Wolf Riders, if you have a critical mass of them, they're pretty decent raiders, but they can also kind of get hard countered pretty easily. They don't hit very hard. They die pretty fast. So like a big PD dump will wipe these guys out. Uh, a thug will wipe these guys out. There's a lot of things that will wipe these guys out. Um... But if you want one running around to, to just force your enemy to do that in a bunch of provinces, you know, it could be worth it. Uh, so anyway, that is the the Vetti Hearse. And uh, then we have the Vetti Jarl, who is 60 leadership, which I think is the highest we get on this nation. Um, he's also a pillager, and he's also stealthy. So, yeah, if you're bringing bigger squads of dudes, you probably want to bring him. Uh, and then finally, we have the Dim Vetti, and the Dim Vetti uh, is your assassin. And there's some pretty cool things about the Dim Vetti. They get uh, the Dusk Dagger, which is going to do draw blood, so very good at killing high priority targets, um, and it's armor negating damage, so again, very nice. And a Poison Dagger. And uh, that's obviously going to be pretty nice as well. Now, uh, what is a good kit for these? Well, first of all, you can use these guys to do Assassin Expansion. They do okay. Versus normal commanders, they're going to kill about two out of three of them if they don't have bodyguards. Versus mounted commanders, it's probably closer to like 50% they'll kill and 50% they'll get killed. And then uh, maybe a little bit worse. When you're actually playing this in a real game, it's going to just feel like complete RNG. Like, some games you're going to do it and you're going to... Assassin Expansion is going to be a great boon. And some games it's just you're going to feel like you just complete, completely wasted cap turns. That's how it feels. And then generally you're going to want to switch. Uh, like, if you do Assassin Expansion, you're going to maybe do two or three turns out of your cap of Assassins. And then you're going to switch to other stuff. Because Assassin Expansion is good at the beginning, but bad at the end of Expansion. So anyway, there's that. These guys kind of have a reawakening once you get Construction 4. And there's a few items you can get that are going to make these guys just murderous, absolutely murderous, and assassinations. Um, and I guess we'll pull up 
uh, a test game with them. And I'll show you. Uh, I'm going to pause it real quick. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. I've just been making a bunch of these. You can see we got a Nature 3. We got an Astral 2. We have not gotten a Death 3. So anyway, this is a pretty good indication of what the mix is you would get. Uh, I don't see a Blood 3 either. Okay, what can we make? Well, let's take a look. We can make... Uh, with our Blood 2s, we can do Lifelong Protections. That's probably the best single Assassin thing. Um, the other things we can do that are pretty interesting... Um, we can do the... Uh, the Mistletoe Garland, which is really cheap, gives us a bit of poison resistance, which is nice, and gives us a luck, which is really good. And uh, these guys don't have a hat, so they also don't even mind the... Uh, they don't mind not having a head slot. So that's a thing you can do. It's just a cheap way to get luck, uh, and luck is really good on these guys. Um, and the other thing you can do is a uh, Rabbit Foot Charm, which actually is pretty good. Uh, it's going to make sure they don't die to some kind of random thing right at the very beginning. Uh, and I think that's it, kind of for the budget kit. Um, if you wanted to, you could give them a shield or something, but honestly, they have pretty good weapons. I think, I will just do it real quick, and I'll just show you how, how decent it is. Uh, I mean, it's, oh shit, we have to blood hunt real quick. Okay, we got a bunch of blood slaves. Oh, we have to do it one more time. Okay, 19, that'll do. And let's make one of these. We'll make one of these. And we'll make... So we've got a Mistletoe Garland, and we're also going to do a Twist Fade Amulet. And one way to think about this is you're basically just protecting your lifelong protection with this stuff. And uh, you don't have good... I feel like I got... Did this get worse? No. These guys really just have no protection. Um, it's a little gimmicky, because you can die, but the way I think you do this is you just do like this. Hold an attack, and if it's something that's hard, by the time he gets him, there's going to be a lot of imps. So you can imagine this with a mage or something, but... I mean, he's going to kill dudes all day long until they have some very specific counter. Let's see if we can get a mounted commander here. There we go. These guys are give you a little bit of trouble, but... <sighs> There's going to be very few things that are going to... Like, maybe an air elemental or something, but luck's going to be pretty helpful with that. Um... Depending on what you're fighting, you know, an ethereal rope. But honestly, the, the trick with these is making them budget. And you're going to be probably mostly constrained. Like, this is only 5 nature and 5 astral. So 10 gems plus some blood slaves. You'll be probably constrained on blood slaves and producing these. But um, if you can, like, if you can make them, there's a very strong argument for like alternating in enough production of assassins to get them out with that kind of kit. And you can mix it up into different things. You can do a handful of the acorns or some other stuff that's pretty good that you're going to have access to as well. You're also going to be able to do water bottles if you want to throw that on. So there's a lot of different kind of permutations you can do. Um, but yeah, your, your assassin game with these dudes is pretty strong. And the other thing that I haven't really said, I guess it's time for kind of well, we have Nepal Jarls, which I gotta say something about. Shit. It's gonna be a long over overview. There's just so much stuff, guys. Ah, okay. Well, we'll talk about Nepal Jarls real quick. Uh, the Nepal Jarls. Uh, okay, well, we get a few different spells. Okay, I'm gonna go. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. Um, so I've got these guys sorted. Uh, here's the Nifl Yarl. And you get him with this spell. It's only blood six, so you can get them pretty early. Um, though to have it up, you need Ill Winter, which if we look at the national only. 
Uh, we get Ill Winter. So these both come available at Blood Six. 86 slaves. He does cost some upkeep, but not a lot. It's pretty low upkeep. And uh, it's basically these guys are badass super combatants. All right. In cold, let's say a huge ass cold aura. They've got uh, ice protection three, which means this is going to jump up to the basic is eight. I don't know. Well, if you you're gonna put gear on them, right? So basically, they're gonna get plus nine to their armor protection uh, just from being in cold, right? So it's gonna be pretty huge. And then on top of that, you can add you know natural protection, however you want to. Uh, they typically are gonna have quickness. This stat because they have cold power uh, is gonna jump up to twenty one defense, and then this is gonna be uh, sixteen attack and Cold three, you can potentially get this up more by having it on your bless or what have you. But um, yeah, they're basically they're super great stat line. In cold, in heat, they start really suffering. But um, yeah, they're super badass as a super combatant. And that being said, um, in my opinion, the main use case for them is they are your air access, um, and they also are air death access. So they're going to be Wailing Winds, Wind of Death. Which having that on a nation is super important. Having that on a blood nation is ridiculously important. Because uh, it means you can do some of the, the hardest cheeses to deal with in the game. Um, yeah. You, the death randoms are really good. You can twice burn these dudes too. Yeah, they're, they're super darn good. The air ones, you want to think about empowering at least one of them so you have some better magic phase attacks. Magic phase is something we're sort of lacking. We can kind of do it if we can make crystal gear. Like, your Astro 1 Gaijas can magic phase attack, and they can kind of do some light thugging if you give them a crystal coin and a starshine skull cap, which isn't something you're going to want to do a lot of, but it's something that's nice to have in your pocket. Um, these guys, however, when they magic phase in, uh, people are going to notice. It is not light thugging. It is heavy thugging, especially in Cold 3. It is super combatant. They are very strong. Um, yeah. What's also nice is you have so much stealthy stuff that you can magic phase them in, potentially with the support of a fluffer. That's like getting to be, you know, like PhD level dominions. Okay, that is the Needful Yarl. We have a few more summons we're going to go through, and then I want to talk a little bit about late game with Fettyheim. Uh, we can get Glow Sals, which are pretty good. They're sacred, they have a heat aura, um, and they trample stuff. They're pretty nice. Um... You have the Brood of Garm, which is going to give you uh, these big nasty wolves that have Fear and Berserk and 30 HP. They're pretty good. They are not undisciplined. I can't remember if were the Glow Sals undisciplined. No, they weren't either. So you can potentially buff these guys as well. They're really good. Uh, mixing in Fear can be really nice, and the Berserk uh, can be really nice too. Because they are... Not undisciplined, you can also put them on Guard Commander if you wanted to, and try to mix them in with some of our our buffing strats. There's other things I didn't even do. God, there's so many buffs I didn't even put on in that first battle I showed you at the beginning of this. Like, we didn't have region on anybody. That's something we can also do. I wouldn't say it's trivial, but it's something we can do. Uh, we have Ill Winter, which is really, really strong. Uh, it's super duper strong. It's going to completely screw over a lot of nations. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. And I don't really care about the being able to recruit giants. The important thing is being able to summon Nifo Yaros, and then that it's going to become Cold 3 everywhere, and unrest being generated in places. For people, I don't think you get the unrest if you're the ca if you're the caster. Sloth of Bears, you get a bunch of these great bear. Um, they're pretty good for Siege Chaff. That is, in my opinion, their, their best use. Um, but I think they're probably overshadowed by the Brood of Garm. That said, you're going to be getting way fewer of these guys. I'm not sure the seed strength for these, but I, I'm pretty sure the bears are going to give you a better seed strength ratio. That said, you have the hurlers. You don't really need these guys for seed strength. You have the Seth Curse, which is a uh, basically a remote curse. I think the only real time you'd want to do this is maybe a pretender. And uh, you have Winter's Call, which... 
is how we get the Needful Jarls. And then we have a Summon Dwarves of the Four Directions, which is a complete luxury spell. Because how you're going to have... To get all these put up, you're going to need about 240 air gems, which is going to be very hard for a non-air nation to get. Um, but if you can get it up, you're going to have Darkness and Perpetual Storm all over the entire planet, which can be pretty nice. And there, there's no way to take it down, uh, except for killing a dwarf. And that is a tricky thing to do. Um, because you can just have the dwarf sit in forts or hide or something, you know? So it's kind of like a global that doesn't require a global slot. It's pretty strong. I can't remember how much it reduces income by. We can check that real quick. If we're doing a national overview. Okay, so we've got this pulled up. I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna summon these guys. Monthly. Oh, he stopped casting it. Shame. For shame. All right. Worldwide event has occurred. Constant darkness and constant storm. Let's see if that affected our income. Uh, that seems to have affected it a lot. Do we get our cap under siege or something? Got a hurricane that struck the land. We look at man. Oh god, I went down a ton. Okay, so yeah, I cut income in half. Jesus. So anyway, that's kind of a game. It's a game ending condition, honestly. It's kind of like Utter Dark. <laughs> it's not as strong, but it appears to cut the gold by about half. Um, which if you're a blood nation, it's going to completely screw over all other nations. Uh, it's basically a good game for non-blood nations if you, if you can keep that up. So that's a game winning condition. I, I mean, if you factor that into everything else, there's a lot of blood in late age. So, you know, it's not like, and you're not even the strongest blood nation, but you are a blood nation. And if your primary competitor is not, ooh. Hard times ahead. Uh, I want to talk. The final thing I want to talk about before we close this out is I want to talk about what late game can look like. I showed you what early mid game can look like, which is you have these abominable hordes, not hordes, these small little squads of berserkers and Vedi Gaija. You can run around with bigger squads too, where you're just getting these berserkers are very solid, even with just wooden warriors put on them. Um, which for a bigger force is all you're probably going to be able to get on them reliably with uh, with fluffers. Um, you can support with crossbow. You can have these guys mixed in for siege strength. There's a lot of ways you can go in the mid game. In the mid game, you're also potentially going to be getting these assassins um, who can just jump in and support your armies as well. Uh, if they have uh, lifelong protections on them. So... You know, they can be kind of all over the place. Um, and then, you know, you're assassinating stuff in the mid game. Uh, you've potentially, very early, you can get very powerful communions online. In my opinion, you want to go alteration first with probably a bit of construction. Um, but then you can probably head down to enchantment or you can also go to conjuration. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention that's really good in conjuration is a spell that hardly ever gets used, but it's Awakened Sleeper. And that gives you a very high leadership dude. Um, that if you want to, you may be able to put, you know, like a shade man on, he can run around with your armies, or you can just have him lead your armies normally, not stealthily. Um, but, uh, he's 120 leadership, so he's going to give two morale bonus, and he's got plus one, or he's inspirational. So you're going to get a total of three morale bonus on your dudes, and you're going to be able to put them in formation. Which, I think by the time you get going towards the late game... He's probably going to be your default commander. Now, that's going to shore up one of the major weaknesses you have, which is not being able to put your guys in formation. Um, and as we talk about shifting into the late game, we're going to have phenomenal research, or we should. 
And uh, with that research, what is it we're going to be able to cast? Well, a lot of these things that we were doing kind of gimmicky with a few mages, fluffing people, we're going to be able to do on mass. We're going to be able to drop mass protection. We're going to be able to drop Wheel of Fates. Those are going to get unlocked at Alt-7 and Alt-8, respectively. Uh, we're going to be getting access to... Uh, we're going to be getting access... So I'll, I'll click on these as we... Do I have debug mode on? One second. I can click properly. Okay. Um, so mass protection, uh, something we're going to look at. Uh, we're also potentially going to be getting army of giants. Um, if we have army of giants, you're going to want people clustered because it's only area of effect ten. And again, like I said, what? Once we get in the army thing, where we're doing big groups of guys and we've got some of the battlefield-wide stuff, you actually don't need to worry as much about uh, like clustering people together to get buffs off and things like this. So um, some of your guys you can put Army of Giants on, but you don't have to. Um, but having a few Army of Giants casters is probably a decent thing uh, in, in, in your armies. You don't necessarily want everybody with it, but it'll make a big difference on Vetti Berserkers. Um, and like I said, mass protection, and then coming into alteration, we still get will of fates, which is really good. The other thing, and this will rely on, we have to go into blood first, but once we get there with blood, uh, blood six so that we can start getting, uh, Nifl Jarls, uh, we potentially can get them, the way you do it is you get a Nifl Jarl, you blood empower them, and then they jump in your communion. Uh, or you can do a crystal matrix. It's your choice whatever is cheaper for you. Um, but they can jump in and potentially do Fog Warriors. And your big armies, you're definitely going to want a Communion. Um, how you set your Communion up is going to be up to you. Um, but yeah, Fog Warriors is going to be quite nice uh, on your little tiny HP dudes because, well, you have to imagine they have Will of Fate. In some ways, there's an anti-synergy with Will of Fates because almost nothing is going to be killing them until they get right to the end when they're probably routing. Um, but I still would rather have Fog Warriors on than not. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to be super good. Will of Fates is going to be better if they have magic weapons. Fog Warriors is going to be better if they don't, probably. But And you can put both on. It's not like you have to pick. Um, so that's a thing. And I'm trying to think what else for air. Uh, the other thing you can potentially look to do is Skeletal Legion, but this will make your dudes uh, diseased, so you may want to skip that. Uh, darkness is something we can do, but we do not have Dark Vision on our troops. So, unless you took it as part of your Bless, you probably want to dodge that one. And I think we've talked about most of the things here. Uh, we get... You could potentially do Wave Warriors, which would be kind of interesting, but I think the hit to your strength might be a bit too much. Quickening is the other big one. Getting up to Alt-8. You actually get a lot at Alt-8. You don't get a lot at Alt-9. Alt-8, you get Will of Fates, and you get Quickening. And Quickening is really good. It means all your Water 2s, you just give them the Water Lens, and every combat they get to do Quickening. An Area of Effect 9 Quickening is going to just... It's going to make a lot of your Vetti Berserkers absolutely ravenous. And now we're getting, you know, like I said, this is all about late mid game. We're getting into like major armies now. Yeah, it, I mean, God, it's so disgusting how these Vetti Berserkers are going to tear stuff up. The other thing you have to start worrying about is we have to start worrying in the late mid game about battlefield wipes. Fog Warriors will help with some of them, um, but we're going to need some resistances. And that's where, well, we're going to have some of them we get an alteration. Like if you're worried about fire wipes, um, in Alteration, again at Alt-8, we get Warriors of Niflheim, which is going to give everybody 5 fire resistance. That's going to be really good in conjunction with Mass Protection. Um, and if you're against like a Super Fire Nation, you may not even do Mass Protection, you may just do this. If you're expecting Firestorm, it's probably better to not do Mass Protection than to just do this. But if you do both, it can be kind of okay. In Enchantment, though, we get uh, Frost Finned, which is going to be nice. We've got... Uh, cold plays, but we've already got frost resistance on most of our troops. 
Uh, we get Grip of Winter. We are a nation that can do excellent fatigue plays. Absolutely excellent. We can do Quagmire, trivially. We can do Grip of Winter. Uh, and we're, we don't even need to cast anything. We're just immune to it. In fact, like, you just should have it up. Uh, we can do Life After Death, which is pretty nice. Uh, we can do Rigor Mortis, which kind of is good, kind of is not. Berserkers are a little weak to Rigor Mortis, but we can throw it up at the same time as we have Relief up. And if we have Rigor Mortis and Relief and they don't have Relief up, then they're in deep trouble. So this is definitely like one of the major plays you can look to make in the late mid game. Um, the other thing is we get Mass Regen. And this is really nice, especially in conjunction with Fog Warriors or in conjunction with Will of Fates. <clears throat> means if you take any damage, uh, they're going to go right back up to full. So that is, there's a lot of good goodies here. Foul Vapor is also, we're a nation that can really do massive wipes. You can throw down Poison Ward, you throw down Foul Vapors on your little group of dudes. You don't need it as part of your Bless. You can take it as part of your Bless, but you don't need it. And you're going to just crush things. So anyway, Foul Vapor is also super duper useful. Uh, we've talked about the main pass we get. In Astral, we get uh, Astral Healing, which can be kind of interesting. We get Anti-Magic, which is good. Um, if we're fighting into Darkness, you probably want to think about putting Solar Brilliance up. And, you know, Anti-Magic, I think almost all our troops have 12 MR, so that would get us up to 16, which is pretty respectable. Pretty darn respectable. Thaumaturgy we, is actually pretty important for us. We get a few things. We get Vengeance of the Dead which is a pretty good spell. We get Mind Hunt, which we can... You know, we don't do very well, but um, Mind Hunt, we need some Evocation and then also Soul Slay. Um, so anyway, it's good to have this in your pocket. And we get Teleport for if we get luck into and, you know, be able to make Crystal Coins or if uh, we just get an Astral 2 Gaijo. And then Mind Burden and stuff. There's a lot of things in here that are good for budget defenses. Um, yeah, it just, there's some pretty, pretty solid stuff in here for, for Astral. Uh, importantly in nature, yeah, okay, here's Touch of Madness. It's Thom 4, and this will only target, I've, I've mentioned it a few times, and it's not a spell that gets used very often, and it will target friendlies, so it cannot target enemies, it doesn't target animate or mindless, and it doesn't mention it here, but it will not ever target commanders. Uh, but it will trigger Berserk, and uh, for that it's really nice. But just one level above it, but much harder to cast, is Growing Fury. And this will make everybody go Berserk when they get <clears throat> um, when they get hit. The caveat for that is, just like with Touch of Madness, they don't actually have to get hit if they already have the Berserker trait. It'll just trigger it. So the cool thing with that um, is that basically it's going to send all of your Berserkers to being Berserk where they get all the bonuses. Um, and you, the downside is that if your mages get hit, it will trigger them because they are, you know, they're going to have this buff on them. But if you do it at the end after all the buffing is done, the mages have done most of their job. So anyway, Growing Fury, very, very accessible. And it's going to come on, you know, like you get a bunch of other stuff like Soul Slay going... Thom 5. Thom 5 is something that you're going to want to get. There's a lot of low-level things we're going to need with this nation, and the higher-level things don't necessarily matter quite as much. Like, Blood, we only have to get up to Blood 6, right, to get Ill Winter and Winter's Call, which is most of what we're going to need from Blood. You know, we'll also get Bind Ice Devil, which is really nice. But I'm not sure if it's better than, like, Winter's Call. Anyway, there's a bunch of stuff that we get um, reasonably early. Um, it's probably worth getting, like, Blood 1 kind of early, too, just to get access to the Sabbaths and to Imps and to Reinvigoration. I'm looking at this thing, what else we need to talk about? Blood Rain is really good. Uh, if, especially once you have Needful Jarls out, you can start doing morale plays. Um, the other thing that's worth pointing out is Blood Fecundity can be nice if you didn't take Growth. I don't know why you wouldn't take Growth, throw in, in Late Age. And, uh, yeah, you've got crossbreeding, which is the word I forgot earlier. And uh, Reign of Toads is going to be something you can get off with a lot of your your uh, Jotun Gaijins. And, yeah, it's 
especially like if, if it's a, a blood two, which you're going to have a lot of, they're all going to be able to cast it with just a blood thorn. So for that, you're probably going to need construction, uh, construction six to get the blood thorns, but then you can drop rain of toads, which again, you have a lot of tools to get out of wars. You don't want to be.
Okay, and yeah, we got some of the better chassis. Well, a lot of times when you kill the size fours, you get this guy, which is like a very, very solid chassis. So you're going to be getting these in, in abundance. In absolute abundance. Uh, and then the, the bird, I think, turned into this one. One of them got a, you can see, a bonus death path here. So this is pretty typical. Like, we did it four times, this is kind of what we got. So... You know, is it worth it just for these guys, like, to get turn half of them into this? I would say 13 gems, it is worth it to do this. Um, I think this guy got a bonus death path, too, actually. Uh, so I would say it's worth it. Um, but what we we're really shooting for is... Let me see. I don't see any great candidates here. but uh, I'll pause it, and I'll, I'll wait till we have another one. Uh, I'll pause it here because we got a foul spot. This is one of the bad things. If you have Lux Tales, it's pretty rare. But if you don't, uh, you're stuck with Feeble Minded. And uh, that has a chance to go away when you twice born. Which this guy did not die yet. So we'll go ahead and kill him. We'll see if it goes away. Somehow he didn't die. Yeah, the people minded went away. So you have a chance to get rid of it. So when you factor that all in, I don't really think a recuperation plus or anything's worth it. Because if you have luck scales, your chances of getting feeble minded are pretty low, and then there's a pretty good chance it goes away when you respawn. Um but if we get a size six guy, which I'm gonna pause until we find one, uh we'll see what happens. Alright, so we got one of them. Um, I didn't, I've been lazy, and so I didn't, uh, I didn't twice born him first, which you want to do. It's a lot cheaper, but when I've got debug mod on, it doesn't matter. So we'll twice born him now. And... Yeah, so anyway, this is size 5. This guy should turn into, uh, a white mage. Which... I'm going to give him a personal region. There's a chance he'll kill this, which would be unfortunate. I think he'll die. Oh shit, he killed it. Oh, what an asshole. Uh, we're going to send him on top of an enemy calf that should do it. PD dump here. Did I give him a nature gem? I did. This should kill him. Yeah, and so you get a white mage. Now, if you look at how many we had to transform, uh, this is without luck scales. It's going to be significantly better, probably twice as good with luck scales. But we had to transform kind of a lot to get one. So this is not like a very reliable way of getting... Um, these mages, but when you do get them, they were extremely cheap that one time you got them. Uh, the thing is, I think this is the right way to think about it, is you have a small chance of getting a jackpot. But, um, all the things you get along the way are going to be really nice in reducing upkeep. So you're going to reduce upkeep, you're going to get a way better chassis, um, and, you know, like, these guys are totally able to be uh, turbo communion batteries, too. There is a niche thing where you take reforming flesh as part of your bless, and you count on getting some of these guys, and you use them as turbo communions. Because they're not inanimate, you can get both of them, a personal region and reforming flesh. Um, you can also take region as part of your bless, and it would also go on them, and you get a 20%. What that's going to mean is these dudes with 20% region, especially if you get enlarged on them, are going to be, you're going to be able to have a big communion on their backs. Um, that said, you know, they need to be one of the astral or blood varieties, or you need to put a matrix on them. So, uh, anyway, that is a thing you can do. It is a thing you can do. Uh, and I think it's something, I think turbo communions with this nation are good enough. It's worth figuring out how to do it. The, you don't have to take it in your bless. You can also just do it with items. You can do ring of regen or hydra skin armor or some, put something on them that's going to give them a bit more 
And honestly, you know, these guys could support without anything except personal region, like six, you know, if you get them enlarged too, maybe like seven or eight communion masters, which would be a lot. So, and especially like if you did a coral sword, which is something you could do kind of trivially, you could probably get eight or nine. So anyway, there you can do a lot of turbo communion stuff with this nation also. Hopefully we get a chance to show that off in the coming game, uh, but we will see. Uh, closing thoughts on the nation. Um, it remains to be seen uh, how we are going to do. I have not started the game yet, so it could be I get rushed and it's a complete clusterfuck. Um, but that being said, I think it is a nation that has a tremendous power curve. It comes online very early at Alt-3 with things that will blow your mind. Um, it then picks up speed as you get to be able to buff more guys with things like Wooden Warriors, and you get Body Ethereal and more buffs. Um, and then uh, once you start getting into some of the mid-game techs with... Okay, before we get there, I mean, we've got the, the Blood Economy going with some of the Blood Items and the Raiding. Uh, you know, with Wooden Warriors, Stealthy Raiders, our whole army Stealthy, all this craziness happening in the mid-game. By the late mid-game, we're starting to buff out I uh, do army-wide buffs, which are going to start being absolutely crazy. Uh, we can have big armies. Uh, it's a scales nation, so we potentially can have phenomenal income. We're going to be chewing through death and nature gems like crazy. Absolutely sight search of death and nature to the max, to the absolute max. Um, it, it, I think it's questionable in the late age how valuable the remote sight searching spells are. I think it's going to be worth it for you to do that for death. I don't know. Uh, on one hand, you want to. On the other hand, you're going to be spending everything you get so damn fast. You definitely want to search it, both of them at least to two. Whether you go up to three is going to depend on how OCD you are. Um, but you're going to be using them so much, right? The nature especially. And I think there's a strong argument to think about taking a dormant pretender that can try to get Mother Oak. You can get Mother Oak without an awake pretender by construction four. But... Um, for that to happen, you have to get a nature random, where you get a nature three. If you get a nature three with armor of twisting thorns, and you may have to have another, like you may need a blood two or three, or you may need to empower in blood once to get the armor of twisting thorns, but you can do it. You get the armor of twisting thorns, you get a thistle mace, you're boom, you're nature five, you can drop mother oak. So, but that's going to be relying on chance. Um, if you get up to construction five or six, you can then do a Moonvine Bracelet, depending on what randoms you get. And uh, with that, you'll also be able to get uh, to Nature 5. I mean, potentially Nature 6 now. So, but that's going to be a later timing than like turn 14 when your god comes up. But you can potentially take a god that's going to either be dormant or awake and researching or something. And you get a very early Mother Earth. The nice thing about that is... Not many people are going to be ready to fight you for Mother Rogue very early. And uh, you are a nation that can use nature gems almost unlike any other. I mean, you honestly, you can spend nature gems so efficiently and so furiously that you really just can't have enough. Um, and then by the time we get in the late game, you're a blood power. Um, and you've got... The, you can do the wombo combo of amazing army fights, uh, amazing morale plays, and amazing uh, fatigue plays. Uh, you don't have a ton of battlefield white potential, except maybe like weird bone grinding shenanigans, but that would be, I think, kind of tricky to do. Uh, but anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I hope you're stoked to watch the game, and I hope I don't embarrass myself. So I will see you guys next time.